This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. One country, two systems. It feels like a good compromise for the people of Hong Kong, who in 1997 were transferred from being citizens of the UK living in British territory under British laws to overnight becoming a special region of the People's Republic of China. However, rather than Beijing just annexing the territory, Beijing and London came together and tried something novel, with the idea being to take the best bits of both systems and bring them together to make something that works for both of them. And at first glance, it does seem like a reasonable idea. The Chinese get to make a more economically advantageous shop front in which to do business with the West, a corner of the country they can put all of the ideas that might fly in the face of socialism with Chinese characteristics, allowing Beijing to stand true to their values and principles, whilst also attracting foreign direct investment and capital into the country at record rates. And the system seemed like it might even work for the populace who preferred living under the British system, as seemingly, they got to maintain all of the benefits they'd enjoyed living under British rule. They got to maintain their independent court system, their much freer markets, their lack of censorship, their ease of doing business, they even got to keep the much easier passage of movement between Hong Kong and countries in the West. On the surface, seems like a job well done. And myself, I've traveled to China a few times and have somewhat of an understanding about how the country tends to work. I spent time in the highly efficient cities like Beijing. I've even spent time in the nearly claustrophobia-inducing Urumqi, the capital of Xinjiang, where there's never a single moment where someone isn't watching you. But for me, that was China. It was exactly what I expected. So, when I travelled to Hong Kong for the first time in 2019, Hong Kong felt nothing like the China I knew. There wasn't a CCP soldier or a policeman on every corner. People were openly scrolling Western social media apps, and students openly discussed politics in the bars. To be honest with you, for those first few hours, I couldn't feel Beijing stare on me the way I had in other parts of China. But that's the thing. Looking back, we all know they were. There's a saying you might hear from people that own livestock or cattle that I actually think fits really well here. And that's that the livestock never notice the fence is electrified until they push the boundary. At this point in the story, it's 2019, and the umbrella riots that would sweep across Hong Kong and the world's newspapers weren't yet in full swing, but everyone knew something was brewing. And that night after a couple of drinks, I stumbled towards a grimy little restaurant in the middle of Hong Kong with a few friends hoping to have a nice dinner. And as we approached the restaurant, a local man clothed head to toe in black would shimmy up a drain pipe attached to the side of the restaurant and spray paint the words, Free Hong Kong, on the outside of the floor above the restaurant. And at the time, I didn't think much of it. I had a great meal, a few drinks, and a good night with a few friends. Then just two and a half hours later, we'd depart the restaurant, hoping to head to another bar somewhere in town. And as I left, I turned around to look up at the political message one last time. But that's a thing. It was gone. Disappeared. In that two and a half hours, it had been identified, marked, and sandblasted off the wall, with the cleaning crew nowhere to be seen. And for some reason, it was at that moment that it dawned on me just how small this paddock was. It demonstrated absolutely clearly just how closely the authorities were watching every single movement in the city. This is the oddity of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's purpose is to serve as a neutral middle ground for companies to do business. That Beijing can keep its predetermined courts on the mainland but they have neutral Hong Kong courts for international firms to use in order to solve any dispute. That Hong Kong banks are supposed to have the ability to transfer money more easily in and out of China. And that Hong Kong has elections and popular representation, a stark contrast with the reality of the mainland. And if you don't look too closely, that's the core ideas behind the one country, two systems. But do those systems still exist? Where does the protest movements that were making front page news every day sit today? Do the principles of one country, two systems actually hold true when tested? And more important than both of those, what is Beijing's endgame here in Hong Kong? Well, those are just some of the questions we're going to be answering here today. And to help us figure out how we got here, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. A Copper-Plated Conquest
1997 or just before in the time of the handover, there was a lot of interaction between Hong Kong and the mainland, but it was very separate. Obviously, it was British administered. It had a British governor general. And there was a very clear sense that the systems were separate. Obviously, we had the handover in 1997 and the 50-year treaty that was supposed to kind of keep that system, that separation locked in place for 50 years. John Fowler is the CEO and co-founder of International Intrigue, a geopolitical publication started by former diplomats to provide people with a diplomat-style briefing on current events unfolding around the world each and every day. And it is an organization that I do highly recommend. Prior to founding International Intrigue, though, John was the Australian consul to China, specializing on the political and economic affairs of the country. John was working in China for many years, including during the Hong Kong protests, and is an expert on the Chinese political system and its relations with the outside world. So we're thrilled to have him on the program today. I think Britain would have been far less happy to hand Hong Kong back to China without that kind of assurance. You have to remember at the time, they were British subjects, essentially. So the idea that Britain would have just handed it back to China to go from a British system to a Chinese Communist Party system without some idea that they were taking care of the people of Hong Kong would have been probably politically impossible for Britain. So Hong Kong makes up a very tiny percentage of China's overall population, but plays a much more significant role within China's economic system. In fact, just last year, Hong Kong made up 64% of all inward FDI into China, most of that being through financial trading through Hong Kong, or businesses basing their headquarters into Hong Kong. But why would these firms choose to headquarter themselves here in Hong Kong rather than larger cities across China like Shanghai or Beijing? In a sort of broad sense, you operate separately on former British rule of law. So if you're a Western business, American business, an Australian business, a European business, you're getting access to mainland China its growth, its opportunities, its capital, arguably, but you're dealing with it in a business environment that you understand because you operate in those countries. So Hong Kong was essentially like a little mini Western business environment with all, and, and actually even more than that, it was super pro business. So it was probably better than a lot of Western countries in terms of low regulations, really business friendly policies, but you're on the doorstep of China. So you have all this access to all the good stuff without taking the risk of operating in Shenzhen or Shanghai, which is that the Communist Party has a very different system of law and order, which a lot of multinational or international businesses, A, don't understand, and B, have no interest in engaging with. In the 90s, Hong Kong was a, a really exciting proposition for the central government in Beijing. You have this idea of, again, this super prosperous, Western compatible business environment right on the doorstep. Now, obviously we've talked about the idea that that means that Western businesses are more likely to invest in China, deal with China because they have that security in Hong Kong, but it, it goes the other way as well. Tons and tons of Chinese businesses were listing on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to get access to international capital. It was almost like this bridge between China and the rest of the world that both sides felt comfortable with because both sides had a little bit of a stake in how it was run. It was a big benefit to China. And at the time of the handover in 97, China was a very different place to the China of now or even in the last five to 10 years under Xi Jinping. This was a China that was pretty intent on liberalizing. It wanted to join the WTO. It wanted to show the world that it could operate as part of the global order, the global system. And managing Hong Kong and having access to Hong Kong and showing that this was where China could possibly go in the future was a huge benefit to them. So the Brits acquired Hong Kong Island using a bit of gumbo diplomacy at the end of the first Opium Wars in 1847, then getting Kowloon, the peninsula just across from Hong Kong Island in 1860, then going further and leasing the rest of the territory north of Kowloon, known as the New Territories, in 1898 for 99 years. And yet, this is the same country that thought appeasement would stop the Germans before World War II. Putting that aside though, for simplicity throughout this episode, we're going to refer to Hong Kong, Kowloon and the New Territories as simply Hong Kong. Now, the UK would hold on to Hong Kong for that 99 years, handing the territories back to China on a ceremony in 1997, but only doing so under the proviso that Hong Kong not become a communist city for 50 years, at which point none of the policymakers who signed off on this would be alive to take any blame, and that Hong Kong would be expected to operate in much the same way it had under the British rule. Now, whilst most of us understand that part of the story, a lot of people do forget what was happening just to the south. As only two years later in 1999, Portugal would hand back the Macau territories back to China, under much the same arrangement that Macau would operate under Portuguese law rather than going back to Chinese law. However, whilst these two stories are so similar, we end up hearing about Hong Kong all the time and very rarely about Macau. So why is that? 
It was a Portuguese colony for 400 years up until 1999, and it was handed back just two years after Hong Kong was handed back by the British. Macau operates under the same system. It is also a one country, two systems principle in Macau. The big difference between Macau and Hong Kong is that Macau is relatively unimportant to China and to the rest of the world. And I say that not to dunk on Macau, but the population of Macau is about 700,000, 700. Hong Kong is more like seven and a half million people. Macau also doesn't have the international financial system that Hong Kong does. It was governed by Portugal, so it has a lot of Portuguese laws and, and the Portuguese civil law system is far less amenable to international business compared to the British common law system. So from Beijing's perspective, it's a very similar situation, but Macau isn't causing the problems. It isn't as important as Hong Kong. So it's obviously not in the news. And, and, and I don't think Beijing sees it as something that they need to kind of deal with urgently. So it, it will probably sit as it is now for a number of years until it gradually moves back into being part of mainland China. One big difference between Hong Kong's system as compared to China's is the maintaining of democracy in Hong Kong. As unlike mainlanders, the citizens of Hong Kong would be afforded the right to vote for a legislative council to represent them and make decisions on their behalf, as opposed to just being ruled by the Communist Party. But Hong Kong's democracy is a bit different to what we'd probably expect in the West. So could you take us through how the democratic system in Hong Kong works and how it compares to what we see on the mainland in China? A lot of folks, I think when they think of pro-democracy, they think of the democracies that we all understand to be one person, one vote, elect a leader. And, and Hong Kong was never like that. So very briefly, at the time of handover in 1997, the first independent, if you like, elections in Hong Kong were held the year after in 98. They had this system of the Legislative Council of Hong Kong, which is the governing elected body in Hong Kong, had 60 seats. Now, where it differs is that at that time, 30 of those were elected by folks like, you know, everyday folks who would go down and vote. 10 of them were elected by what's known as rural committee. And then another final 20 were elected as functional constituencies, which kind of means special interest groups, business groups. This idea that um, Hong Kong's democracy at that time and still, well, up until about 2021, really gave voice to businesses and other interests in in the city rather than just saying hey it's it's only people who can vote in 2010 the legislative council was expanded to be 70 seats and then in 2021 it was actually expanded to be 90 seats now the difference between the most recent um, makeup of the legislative council uh, in 2021 to 1997 is that you have most of it, I think 88 or, or, or even more of the 90 seats are now dominated by Projing and, and that was not the case in 1997. The idea of Hong Kong's system originally was that those 60 seats of the Legislative Council would see a balance between the three interested parties, the largest receiving 30 seats of the Council being chosen by the functional constituencies. Now these are made up of businesses, trade lobbies, finance firms and other key sectors of Hong Kong's economy, which as weird as business lobbies having that much power sounds, kind of makes sense for a city like Hong Kong. The second largest group, which would be assigned 20 seats, would then be elected by the popular vote. In other words, the citizens of Hong Kong, with the third and smallest group being the 10 seats of the selection committee, with the selection committee not exclusively, but mostly picked by Beijing. So in those early days, Beijing only really had one sixth of the council as being definitely Beijing friendly, resembling something somewhat similar to democracy. And importantly, those 60 seats would then elect a chief executive, which oversimplified is kind of like a president of Hong Kong. However, to no one's surprise, Beijing would be less than chuffed with only being given a 1-6 guarantee over the council, and in such would amend the rules to give Beijing a bit more advantage. At first, they would change up the numbers on the council to give the business councils more rights and more votes, opening the door to changing the rules as we go on which later on China would use to amend the rules on who can actually run for election, as well as the amount of legislators in the council, with Beijing putting in rules like only patriots who respect the Chinese Communist Party can run in elections. So funnily enough, a lot of anti-Beijing candidates quickly found themselves unable to run, and the legislative council became full of people that Beijing had already approved of. So can you take us through these reforms and how they affected Hong Kong? Yes. So the short answer to that is they, they can pick who runs in the sense that all candidates essentially need to be vetted by Beijing. That's what a lot of the protests over the last 10 years in Hong Kong have been about, that the elections are not really free and fair. They are a choice between pro-Beijing candidates who don't really differ on that view. 
once they've elected the, the chief executive, these pro-Beijing lawmakers in place in Hong Kong have other ways of influencing which legislation gets put up and, and what happens in Hong Kong while maintaining this veneer of not really being involved in the day-to-day. But obviously they are. Um, nothing in Hong Kong anymore can happen legally without Beijing implicitly ticking it off. So Beijing would then try to use their new candidates in the council to bring forward favourable bits of controversial legislation that would continue to tilt the scales in Hong Kong back toward China. One of these including the infamous extradition treaty, so that Hong Kong residents, critical of Beijing, would no longer be safe to criticise Beijing from Hong Kong, and that for various crimes people could now be extradited from Hong Kong back to the Chinese mainland to stand trial, where the court system runs under Chinese law, not British law. Now, even though China was able to pick who was able to run, they still weren't happy enough with their advantages within the council, so it would try to amend the council's makeup by increasing its overall size. With the new makeup of the council being that Beijing's picks became the biggest block at 40 seats, the business lobby's functional constituencies would get 30, and the popular vote would remain stuck at 20 seats, effectively diluting the amount of power they have in the council. Now, attempting to pass these laws is what kicked off those huge province-wide protests we all saw back in the news in 2019 when millions of Hong Kongers took to the streets to express their concerns of these changes. Now, at the time, these protests seemed to provide a direct challenge to the rule of Beijing and Hong Kong, and tensions were incredibly high. And to many who were following it at the time, it seemed like a coin flip whether Beijing would send in the army from the mainland to crush it, or fold, push back to the table, and democracy would live to see another day in Hong Kong. However, by cruel fate, during this exact moment, 900 kilometers to the north of Hong Kong in Wuhan, someone would screw up a soup so badly that it would crash the entire global system for a while. With the pandemic sweeping through China and Hong Kong, and the city entering some of the world's harshest lockdowns. Now, whilst the government had failed to pass these reforms back in 2019, and had temporarily taken them off the table, Beijing was never going to let a good crisis go to waste, and would quietly pass them during the lockdowns in 2021. So now that these reforms are all in place, how do they play out across Hong Kong? So the changes in 2021 were were kind of like the final nail in the coffin of any idea that Hong Kong will have democracy going forward. It was a series of reforms initiated by the National People's Congress. That's that's the parliament in Beijing, the parliament of mainland China. And they added to Hong Kong's basic law, which remember is the constitution of Hong Kong. They added a series of electoral reforms into the constitution. So they didn't pass law like you expect, you know, they didn't go through the legislation to pass the law. They just they just added it into the, the, the Hong Kong basic law. And it did things like prevent anyone who wasn't a, a patriot, meaning someone who, I guess, is patriotic towards Beijing. Anyone who wasn't patriotic can no longer stand for election. Not that they can't win, but they can't even stand. They can't be elected at all. And it did some other things that basically meant that, realistically, Beijing is handpicking the chief executive of Hong Kong, who's currently John Lee, that being the same John Lee, who served as Hong Kong's heavy-handed pro-Beijing deputy commissioner of the Hong Kong police force during the riots. As John would express great fondness for Beijing and would run for chief executive in 2022 as the sole candidate for the position. But administratively, as awful as all of this feels, it was all going to happen anyway in 2047, when the 50-year deal ends, and China would no longer be bound by the British treaties they signed when they acquired Hong Kong in 1997. So why would Beijing go through all of this and take on so much risk to Beijing and the city's reputation if they're on track to just inherit all of this anyway? For Beijing, Hong Kong is a balancing act insofar as how useful is Hong Kong to mainland China, to Beijing, versus how much of a threat is it? I think you've seen that balance change over the last 10 years from being a real credit to Beijing in the sense that they could run a little international finance and capitalism hub off their coast without it affecting the mainland's political systems. But then we saw the protests and it started to move towards becoming a threat to mainland stability. So the question is how Hong Kong develops from here until 2047. And I think in Beijing's situation, it kind of just goes along exactly as it is right now, as, as we're talking in 2023, wow. the idea that there are still foreign businesses in, in Hong Kong. There are still plenty of folks doing business in Hong Kong who say, yes, it's changed since the early 2000s, but we're still fine. We can still access Chinese capital. It's still great for us. It's that, that's great for Beijing because they've kind of neutralized the threat of, of democracy. So it's no longer a, a stability threat to the mainland government. If that continues, great. 2047 probably then in Beijing's eyes looks like the official bringing back of Hong Kong into the mainland governing system. It probably becomes a city like Shanghai, Beijing, 
Chongqing and Tianjin, which are the big cities in in China that are managed directly by the central government. That is a perfect scenario for Beijing. Hong Kong becoming a province level city of China. Of course, if that was seen as a big enough threat, perhaps Beijing might move earlier than 2047 to bring Hong Kong back into direct control uh, of mainland China. Now, when Beijing reacquired Hong Kong in 1997, it acquired a number of key assets with it, one of which being the city's thriving financial hub, with Hong Kong becoming a crucial source of much needed capital for the now skyrocketing Chinese economy. So Beijing would need to do whatever they can to try and keep these companies feeling like the UK never left and that business could continue on as usual, even though the management had changed. How they would do it was still up for debate though, whether they would continue to foster the UK's approach to Hong Kong or that whilst democracy would be under direct attack, China would always protect them from protesters or any political movements that might pop up. The second asset they acquired was the long-standing democratic-ish traditions in the territory. That one, Beijing would be a little less sure about keeping. The third asset, however, would be the Hong Kong system itself, a city that would foster growth in the city unseen across any other place in China up to that point. It's a system that would see Hong Kong being the city with the most people living in it with more than $30 million USD to the name. It's a system that would see Hong Kong making up 27% of China's overall GDP, whilst being just a fraction of the population. And it's a system that would see Hong Kong having a GDP per capita, that of just below the Netherlands, which is even more impressive when considering the widespread poverty across the rest of China at the time. But what has China done with its inheritance? Do they try and reduce some of the inequality they criticize the British for across the city? Did they try and close some of the tax and money laundering loopholes that were costing governments around the world billions in lost revenue? Or did they try and stop Hong Kong becoming every criminal's headquarters across Asia? What did China do with its inheritance? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, uprooting the umbrellas. We can certainly say that it is easier to launder money and move money freely in Hong Kong than it has been in mainland China. Um, and for that reason, it has been a hub for money laundering. Now, there is and has been ongoing challenges within the bureaucracy well before Beijing took back control of Hong Kong in terms of fraud and corruption across Hong Kong. And that, that has been an ongoing challenge. So if the general question is, is money laundering and transnational serious organised crime state sponsored in Hong Kong? I think the very clear answer to that is no. But if the question is, um, members of government, both in Hong Kong and in Beijing, complicit with or involved with and the laundering of money or the conduct of transnational serious organised crime, I think we'd have to most definitely say yes. John Coyne is the head of the Northern Australia Strategic Policy Centre and the head of Strategic Policy and Law Enforcement at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. He regularly works with multiple national governments, advising on defence and organised crime, and has written a number of fantastic papers on money laundering and its wider geopolitical impacts. He's also a great friend of the show, and we're thrilled to have him back on the program. Now, regulating massive economic growth that has occurred over incredibly short periods of time is very difficult. The authorities in Hong Kong don't want to impact upon the economic benefits of being a financial hub globally. One of the oddities of the Chinese system is that it is remarkably easy to put money into it, but incredibly hard to get that money out of it. Particularly for Chinese citizens, the system works hard to prevent people from converting any decent sums of Chinese yuan or Hong Kong dollars back to USD or other global currencies, as other global currencies could be sent abroad or spent on other products. So for Chinese citizens, they either have to spend all of their money inside China or find innovative ways to get their money out of the country. Now, the mainland's rules are always very difficult to get around, but Hong Kong and Macau serve as a backdoor out of the Chinese system for many rich citizens of China. The main method used to be the casinos in Macau, the Portuguese colony famous for its casinos. How the Macau system worked is that a rich Chinese person would pay $100 million worth of RMB to the casino for an all-inclusive package, with this package usually giving them accommodation and one or two good nights out. But it would also give them $100 million worth of chips to spend at the casino. 
Now they'd be expected to gamble around 1 to 2 million of that, losing a bit to the casino, but at the end of the night they'd be able to cash in their 98 million dollars worth of chips to the casino cages. And then, because of Portuguese law, the casino would be able to send their winnings to a bank account overseas, in another country like the UK or Panama, and be able to transfer it in US dollars rather than RMB. And for a lot of Chinese citizens, this was the easiest way to convert their money to a currency where they can spend it on products overseas. Now, surely Beijing knows about these loopholes in the Macau casinos. So why don't they work to close these back doors? You walk the floors of the casino in Macau and you watch the quantity of money going across the gambling tables in Macau, it's significant. Certainly Beijing has introduced a number and a range of controls in place to avoid the transfer of wealth outside of mainland China to Macau. The unintended consequences of that is that what we've also now seen is an explosion of issues here in Australia with junket trips to Australian casinos. But what we have also seen, and probably more devastating for the broader ASEAN region, and certainly the Mekong region, is a proliferation of poorly regulated casinos right across the Mekong Delta in countries like Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. And so what we're seeing is, is a dispersal. So there has been a stricter regulation of the Macau casino market and the movement of wealth in and out of mainland China to Macau. That hasn't changed Macau as a global gambling hub. It's certainly affected its bottom line. But the less beneficial effects of that or the second order impact of that is, is we've seen the increase in the number of casinos and across the region in the hundreds. Now, China doesn't always stop but the money makes it overseas either. So citizens trying to hide their money abroad often had to maintain extra care and be very careful where they send their money to and who knows about it. And why we know all this is that just a few years ago, investigators dug up a number of operations that showed just the lengths that the Chinese are willing to go to to chase down some of this fleeing Chinese money with the uncovering of Operation Fox Hunt and Operation Skynet. Operation Fox Hunt, discovered in 2014, saw China tracking down Chinese citizens who'd fled abroad with their money to countries like the United States, Canada, and the UK, to which once located, China would then usually send a couple of operatives, often under tourist visas, to pay their fleeing citizen a bit of a visit. Under the guise of tackling corruption in China, China would send their operatives to these countries and then illegally kidnap these people to bring them back to China so their money could be seized and they could stand trial for corruption. Operation Skynet, discovered in 2015, was virtually the same program, except that China made more of an effort to at least ask the fugitive, once that agent was standing over them and had tracked them down in the foreign country, to politely ask them to come back to China, rather than just kidnapping them straight away. Even though that kidnapping was also the backup plan if the citizen was rude enough to deny this operative's polite request. On top of that, as part of Operation Skynet, there was also allegations that came out that China had been spying and hacking into foreign banks to track down these citizens and their missing money, which again, is highly illegal. So can you take us through why China would resort to programs like this to get this money back into China and what effect it might have had on the populace over there? If we look at Fox Hunt and Skynet, which are the two programs that have been operated globally across the world to pursue Chinese citizens who have escaped with wealth and to bring them to justice and to return that money. And what we see is those sorts of programs also have a tendency of being used to target people on a political basis. And certainly, let's be very clear about this, the evidence of that really starts coming up when we look at Fox Hunt and Skynet. And then when we also look at um, how Chinese officials have used Interpol red and yellow notices to track down dissidents and how many of those have been rejected on the basis that they're more likely politically driven than they are driven by uh, the pursuit of criminals. So if these citizens can't keep their money in overseas banks, knowing that China could hack the bank and track them down, they often then turn to overseas real estate as their main source of cleaning and laundering their money, with Chinese millionaires often buying properties historically in countries like Australia, Canada, and the UK, with the UK in particular making it very easy to hide who the owner of that property is across a series of LLCs and shell companies, making it harder for both the taxman and the Chinese authorities to be able to track them down. Now, the advantage of placing your money into overseas real estate is that it's not only out of the reach of the Chinese authorities, but you can also charge higher rents in globally convertible currencies, you know, Canadian dollars, Australian dollars, or Great British pounds, all of which can be paid into foreign bank accounts that never actually enter China. 
This process also gets done in the Hong Kong real estate market as well, but in that case, it's mostly to trade it as a speculative asset that they can then sell on to foreign buyers, which those foreign buyers would then usually be expected to pay that money into a foreign bank account rather than a Chinese or Hong Kong one. And by the way, this is also the exact same reason you see so much Russian money within the London real estate market, as using real estate allows you to convert dirty sanctioned rubles into spendable and convertible British pounds, which is an absolutely fantastic system as long as Liz Trust isn't in power. And on top of that, as a bonus, the Russian and Chinese citizens doing this can also use that real estate as collateral to then apply for an equity line of credit with British, Australian, or Canadian banks in order to give these financial fugitives boatloads of very quick, globally spendable cash. After all, the bank is very likely to give you a low interest loan if the house is already paid off. Now, we've also seen a big uptick in this process over the recent years, as there have been crackdowns by Moscow and Beijing to prevent money leaving Russia and China. And there have been some efforts put in by some of these countries to prevent Russian and Chinese money entering the system. However, these are where these middle jurisdictions come into play, with Russians formally using Cyprus as their middleman to get to the UK, and China using Hong Kong as their backdoor into the British system. But can you take us through what the end game is here with this money for these Russian and Hong Kong oligarchs? I think you hit the nail on the head. We have seen in Sydney and Melbourne, inner city apartments and investments, been a relatively safe place to invest large sums of money. Residential real estate in major cities, it's increasingly so. The basic premise here is taking legitimate or illegitimately sourced funding, washing it through a series of processes and introducing it into the legitimate economy and then being able to use it. That's done in a whole range of, of ways. We've seen Chinese money launderers who have been operating, you know, incredibly glitzy money exchanges. The majority of their business was exchanging money and transferring money through remittances offshore. And what they were able to do is amongst all of that traffic is take in cash as that looked like legitimate funding transfers and transfer that into around the world and including into Hong Kong. Once that money's transferred across, it's introduced into the legitimate economy. It's able to then be used to purchase and invest in real estate. Trade-based money laundering is another really good way that money's moved into Hong Kong and then invested in. So I sell a set of products that are actually worth nothing and I, to produce and I sell them across into Australia or to another country, money is transferred back to pay for those goods. It's then introduced into the legitimate economy and then I use it from there to purchase houses, purchase apartments. I rent them out and all of a sudden I have a long-term investment that's paying off on a regular basis. Okay, but for China, one of the only ways this system is still accessible for the upper crust of the country is thanks to the laxer finance laws in Hong Kong as compared to the rest of the country. Now, we know Xi has been tightening the screws on Hong Kong over the last few years, and 2047 is just around the corner anyway. But do you think Xi would be willing to close the Hong Kong system down in order to shut off the escape valve for wealthy Chinese tycoons cash trying to get overseas? Or frankly, the Hong Kong system is just too important to Xi as an avenue of raising foreign capital, that it would be almost impossible for him to close the valve off. So from my perspective, I'm not so sure that Beijing or Xi Jinping is particularly happy with either Macau or Hong Kong being a global money laundering hub, and it certainly doesn't help their narrative. There are a number of members of the Chinese Communist Party who are linked with and associated with the sorts of crime we're talking about here. The last thing that the Chinese Communist Party, led by Xi Jinping, wants to see is dissidents and or corrupt officials fleeing from mainland China and taking sovereign wealth with them. I can only see the regulatory and legislative environment in Hong Kong and indeed Macau being more constrained. Now, having said that, though, I think it'll continue along a path where Macau and Hong Kong will increasingly become more like the special economic zones. Um, for the average Western visitor who comes there, they won't really notice massive amounts of difference. But for those living there, the regulatory environment will become more complex. Now, when Beijing tried to pass their political reforms through Hong Kong back in 2019, Restirring the umbrella movement protests right across the territory, the justification from Xi Jinping was always that these harsh crackdowns and responses from the authorities were all about reassuring business confidence across the territory. In his words, 
restoring order to the chaos. From all accounts, she was hoping to send the message that he would be happy to crack down on the population as hard as necessary to reassure foreign capital holders in Hong Kong that law and order would be maintained under his leadership and that they could feel safe keeping their money there. Xi really didn't want that money leaving Hong Kong. But how well do you think that message actually came across to those foreign capital holders, those banks and hedge funds currently based in Hong Kong? Did it give them the reassurance they were looking for, or did it make them a bit worried about what might happen in the future if they were to anger the administration? Look, I think any time that there's uncertainty, and you've got to remember, at the core of all corporate activity, boards are looking at risk, shareholders are looking at risk. Any time there's uncertainty, that changes the risk equation. And as a result of that, companies make decisions based on risk and opportunity, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Beijing, or whether you're in um, Washington, D.C. When you're going through and looking at legislative change and introducing new laws, it's very difficult often to, to get a greater understanding of the second order impacts. So if your question was one of, has Beijing changed the legislative environment? Yes, they have. Did they do so to give greater business confidence? Well, probably, but also as, as a mechanism to further control any opposition. Now, has that had, and did they plan for it having negative impacts on the finance sector, I, I would probably suggest some people would have calculated that the introduction of all this new legislation and this new regulatory environment and see it as a positive. And, you know, in that classic thing, there's always a danger of strategic miscalculation when you assume that everyone else will think the same way that you do. Unfortunately, Beijing consistently shows in many of its actions, be it the application of economic coercion, wolf warrior diplomacy, it strategically miscalculates the impacts of its actions. Hong Kong has a number of pretty serious problems with crime, with protests, with corruption, with inequality, and Beijing has chosen to use force to solve some of these problems producing some of the most alarming scenes throughout the territory's history. But all of this, according to Xi himself, was done to, in his words, have restored order from chaos. That as long as the business community felt safe and secure, and people had faith in the business and trade institutions that powered the city of Hong Kong, Hong Kong would still serve its central purpose to Beijing and the Central Communist Party. But how has the financial community reacted to all this? Has Beijing's firm hand given them a reason to stay, seeing it as protection for their companies? Or can outsiders more clearly than ever finally see the writing on the wall for Hong Kong? Well, to answer that question, we turn to our final guest. Part 3. The Last Castle of Capitalism Hong Kong is important to the Chinese system because Hong Kong is essentially the capitalist financial outpost of China. It is supposed to be China, but with Western characteristics, meaning that Hong Kong is supposed to have a good legal system and a good financial system. And if those two things are trusted, then foreign companies can put their money there and be there and feel safe. Dan Harris is an international lawyer and partner at Harris Lewoski, a global law firm specializing in cross-border trade and financial acquisitions for large companies. While Dan speaks extensively on international law, his specialization is in the legal system of China and Hong Kong, even running the famous China Law Blog, with Dan having argued more high-profile financial cases in China than just about anyone else. So we're thrilled to have him on the program today. It was a place where they would set up for China. It was a place where they would hire lawyers, accountants, use the banks, and arbitrate cases. But it really isn't that place anymore. So one of the big issues you'll find yourself constantly grappling with around Hong Kong will be arbitrations, where two companies, possibly from two different countries, might turn to the local court system in order to settle a dispute between the two. For Hong Kong, one of the big selling points was the businesses would use their court system, which was always seen as much fairer to outsiders than the court system on the mainland. But can you take us through why that fact would be so important to businesses and also how true that statement might be today? Arbitration matters because it is a common way in which international disputes are resolved. 
And those disputes could be disputes between, let's say, an American company and a Chinese company, an American company and a Japanese company. A lot of times, arbitration is a convenient, effective way to resolve disputes between companies. A secondary question is, why is arbitration in Hong Kong important? And my initial answer is, it's not. There are plenty of places where you can arbitrate. In fact, even when Hong Kong was essentially the choice 10 years ago, it was the common locale for arbitrating a dispute between, let's say, an Asian company and a U.S. or European company. So big matters with big clients, we would nine times out of 10 arbitrate in Hong Kong on matters involving Asia. Now, there was always this view that was based somewhat on fact and somewhat on myth that Hong Kong did have one advantage, and that was there was a view which was that Hong Kong arbitration decisions were somewhat easier to enforce in China than arbitration decisions from anywhere else. What also started happening is that big Chinese companies, mostly state-owned companies, started requiring that their disputes be resolved in Hong Kong. And that probably was due to some sort of directive that was coming down from on high in Beijing. What's happened now is the government-owned Chinese companies or the government-impacted Chinese companies, and if you add those two together, you're hitting a huge percentage of Chinese companies. They typically require that disputes be arbitrated in Hong Kong rather than Singapore. Basically, they're trying to save Hong Kong's ass. And it's working to the extent that virtually nobody I know wants to arbitrate in Hong Kong anymore. But when you're dealing with a Chinese company, you have to arbitrate in Hong Kong. So they're having arbitrations in Hong Kong now because these are arbitrations that arose from contracts that were signed two, three, five, six, ten years ago. But 10 years from now, I would expect arbitrations in Hong Kong to be way, 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 way down from where they are now. Do you think this is part of the bubbling exodus that seems to be popping up at the moment, as we're beginning to see much of the finance world moving away from Hong Kong? As it is, we've already seen 14% of all Hong Kong-based funds' assets having fled the territory in recent times, with about half of that money ending up in Singapore by the looks of it. But do you think that means that Singapore will end up as the financial hub after Hong Kong, or people are just looking for any rock in the storm at the moment? Well, for the last 10 years, everybody has been asking, what is the next China in terms of manufacturing? And I always answer by saying, there is no next China in terms of manufacturing. There are a bunch of next Chinas that together are going to equal China. It's India, it's Mexico, it's Vietnam, it's Thailand, it's Colombia, it's Peru, it's Portugal, it's Poland. They're all stepping in for China. So who can replace Hong Kong for, let's say, arbitration, for finance, etc.? Well, obviously, Singapore is an answer. But let's take IPOs. Singapore is not going to step in for Hong Kong on IPOs. So where are those going to go? Well, some are going to go to New York, some are going to go to London, some might even go to Beijing. Every company is different, every situation is different. But slowly but surely, Hong Kong is hurting, and every indicator says that. And I do not see it recovering. I do not see it disappearing tomorrow. That's not going to happen. But I do see slowly disappearing. Whereas five years ago, a company that would have said, we need to IPO in Hong Kong, it might now be looking at Hong Kong and three other cities. Or maybe it's not even looking at Hong Kong at all. If a firm was looking to relocate from Hong Kong, there are only really a few options available to them in Asia. 
as they want somewhere that would be comfortable to live, probably have high English proficiency, and make doing business in Asia fairly easy. Now, while Singapore does tick a lot of boxes, it's also undercapitalized, with Singapore's stock exchange only having around $400 billion worth of value, as opposed to Hong Kong's, which currently has $5 trillion worth of value. On the other hand, Tokyo's exchange does have the money to handle it, but it's much stricter about its working rules, and it's often described as being more geared to funding Japanese businesses rather than the Japanese economy or the world economy as a whole. But what about the Shanghai Stock Exchange? The Shanghai Stock Exchange is absolutely huge and has the capital sitting there and would allow investors to get even further into the Chinese system. And if the worry about Hong Kong is that it is becoming China, investors could look to get ahead of the game and put their money into Shanghai where doing business is often much cheaper. The logic does make some sense, but can you take us through why you probably wouldn't put your money into the Shanghai Stock Exchanges and some of the pitfalls that lie there? If I'm a big international company, that five years ago might have gone public in Hong Kong. Am I going to go public in Shanghai? No way. Am I going to put huge amounts of money in a bank in Shanghai? No way. It's just not going to happen. But if I'm a Chinese company that's getting pressure from the Chinese government, am I going to put my money in a bank in Shanghai? Actually, probably not. Uh, and the reason I say that is because we deal with Chinese companies all the time. And any of them that are remotely sophisticated have bank accounts outside of China. A lot have, still have them in Hong Kong. A lot have them in the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Jersey, etc. And based on what I've heard from our clients, my goal would be to get my money and my assets out of out of Hong Kong, not immediately, but to get them out. I mean, if you're a business person and you look at the relationship between Hong Kong and China and you're savvy about these things, you know that Hong Kong is China and it's not two systems anymore. It's one and a half systems. And that half system is Hong Kong, and it is slowly but surely being swallowed up by China. Okay, but if you and all these bigger companies can see the writing on the wall at the moment, what actually stops them from leaving? Why can't they just get their money out of Hong Kong today? Well, first off, it's always been difficult to move money out of China. Always. And there are times where it's not just difficult, it is impossible. Historically, when China start running low on hard currencies, they start making it almost impossible to get money out. I've had American friends who could not send $5,000 from China to the U.S. for months because China had quietly put hard capital freezes out. And they would tell the banks, just tell them you can't do it today. So my friend would go in every day and they would say, it's the system's broken or whatever. They would come up with all these reasons why the money couldn't leave. It was because the banks were being told, we need this hard currency. We are low. Don't let it leave. And if you're a Chinese citizen, you're not allowed to send out more than 50000 a year from China without approval from the Chinese government beforehand. And that approval typically takes two years and is virtually never given. That's why so many Chinese companies have British Virgin Island bank accounts. It's because if they didn't, they could never move their money internationally. So a very quick story, a Fortune 50 company once came to us because they had bought a, an American company and this American company had 20 suppliers in China. And this Fortune 50 company was very troubled by the fact that all 20 of these Chinese suppliers, and I'm rounding off the numbers here, had their bank accounts in Hong Kong. So they said, why do these companies have their bank accounts in Hong Kong? And I said, well, we can research, but I know that the laws are going to be vague. And we're going to come back to you and say it's not very clear. And they said, look, we're a publicly traded company. We're a huge company. We need to know. Do the research. So we did the research, came back to them and said, the laws are not clear. And then they said, well, we need to find out whether these companies actually have authorization, which is required. So we wrote all 20 companies and said, 
are you authorized? Nine of them sent us fake government certificates. Those were the honest ones. 11 of them came back and said, come on, of course we're not. This is what everybody does. So the reality is we've done deals in the United States where a Chinese company buys an American company, but the money never, ever has come from China. It's always come from the British Virgin Islands or someplace like that because it can't come from Hong Kong because it would take two years to get the approval and the approval would actually never come. Now, all of this would be overseen by the JFIU. Figure something like FinCEN from the US Treasury Department is a bit of an equivalent. Now, the JFIU oversees all transactions coming in and out of Hong Kong, ostensibly looking for money laundering, organized crime, or tax evasion. But in addition to this, as many businesses from the US or UK or Australia would know, the JFIU also looks into IP and business information when looking into your transactions. And you are expected to turn over lots of information to the JFIU about the products you have coming in and out of China, which on paper, the JFIU is supposed to keep that information to themselves. Although in recent times, they have been caught being less than 100% squeaky clean, with some arguing that upon instructions from higher ups in Beijing, they've allowed some money laundering to come through Hong Kong, particularly types that might be advantageous to HSBC or even Beijing itself. They've even been accused of passing on some information they found about Western products coming into Hong Kong onto members of organized crime or even authorities in Beijing. Now, the JFIU will often make the final decision on what can come in and what can come out and what information has to get passed along. And they can also end up ruling on cases where a local Chinese company may have stolen IP or proprietary technology and is now producing copies of it in either Hong Kong or Beijing after a Western company will go to the JFIU with that information. But whilst this all sounds pretty bad, when it comes to financial affairs, the JFIU still has a somewhat decent relationship within the trade circle. So can you take us through what's actually going on here with the JFIU and why there are so many contrasting stories about people's dealings with the organization? The JFIU is, it's China's court system. I was talking about it with an in-house lawyer at a company we represent. And this client was surprised when I said that until a few years ago, you could actually count on China's courts ruling fairly on disputes involving companies about 95% of the time. And it's what a lot of lawyers who deal with China call the 95% rule, which is the Chinese judges, and I have a law professor friend who says we shouldn't even call them judges, and he's actually right. They're nothing but government bureaucrats they rule fairly 95% of the time because China knows that it's important that their courts appear to be fair. So they basically tell them rule fairly on anything except these sorts of matters. And on those matters, you come to us and we'll figure out how to rule. So what I always say is if your company has the world's best, the most cutting edge rubber ducky technology, we can protect it. And if somebody steals it, we can sue them in China and we will win because the CCP doesn't give a damn about rubber ducky technology. So they want you to win so that the world thinks you can do business in China. But if you have cutting edge semiconductor technology, good luck. And so then I say, where does your technology fit on that spectrum? And it's oftentimes surprisingly difficult to figure out because a few years ago, in a span of about six months, we had three companies come to us who immediately had their hearing aid technology stolen by their potential suppliers in China. And I thought, this is very weird. What is going on here? So I talked to a friend of mine in Silicon Valley. She deals with IP protection, especially focusing on technology. I said, what's going on here? Why does China seem to care so much about hearing aid technology? She goes, military. I go, what? She goes, military. It's very important for the military to be able to hear things. I go, okay, that explains it. So the point is that if it's important to China, 
it will happen. The government will overwhelm the courts, overwhelm everything. They'll tell these hearing aid companies, you need to steal this technology. Don't worry, you'll be fine. In fact, we'll pay you for it. And then they do it. Well, that's the same thing in Hong Kong, except China is smart. They're not going to overwhelm the JFIU in some incredibly bad way and immediately scare everybody off. They're going to do it slowly and insidiously, and they're going to do it. They're not going to do it with the equivalent of a rubber ducky company. They're going to do it with the equivalent of a semiconductor company. Well, if the last thing keeping a lot of these businesses in Hong Kong was the fairness of their courts and organizations like the JFIU, with people running under the assumption that the courts will either rule in their favor or at least rule fairly, if even that assumption is now disappearing, then where do you see the financial usefulness for Hong Kong going forward over the next decade or so? What people don't realize is that there is so much bubbled up dissatisfaction with China and Hong Kong. And nobody's going to go public with that. In fact, I tell our clients, if you're going to leave China, the best way to do it is to get everybody out, to get all your assets out, and then pick up the phone, sitting on the couch from your home, and say, hey, Mr. Zhang, just letting you know, we're done. We don't have anything there anymore. It's been great so long. That's how you have to do it. So I'm always fascinated when a company leaves China and there were no rumors about it. I always think kudos to you. But as a lawyer, I know what's going on. Every client I spoke to for the last few weeks said, we want to get out as soon as we possibly can. Every single one. And I tell that to people, they go, well, that can't be because why are so many still there? My answer is, wait. You don't understand wanting to get out and being able to economically get out or even possibly get out are two different things. And it's the same thing with Hong Kong. Every company is thinking about and wanting to leave Hong Kong. That doesn't mean all of them will leave because there are reasons some of them need to stay. Maybe they have 30 people there who are really qualified and re moving to Singapore isn't really necessarily going to work. Some of them will probably leave on Monday and some of them might not leave until Monday, two years from now. But it is happening and they want to leave. At one point, Hong Kong was seen as possibly having the best economic system in the world the perfect mosaic of the most innovative parts of UK capitalism that drive innovation and development, whilst also having the forward direction and central stewardship of Beijing's socialism with Chinese characteristics. But now, many years since handover, the data from the experiment is in, and the reality is quickly demonstrating to us that Hong Kong, in fact, ended up with probably the worst bits of both systems. It still does have hardcore capitalist tendencies running right through the city. And for those who used to brag about the territory's free markets and ease of business, they're watching those systems play out, watching more and more industries in Hong Kong become further and further consolidated. Even now, Hong Kong's famous port, once one of the busiest in the world, now has 21 of its 24 berths owned by just two companies, as those two companies have decided to buy out the others. Even their famous tax system has now become a problem for the territory, with the UK-styled tax loopholes costing the Hong Kong system 1.2 billion US dollars every year due to evasion, whilst costing the rest of the world $19 billion a year due to outside investors being able to hide their money here. Even the once revered Hong Kong traders now complain about the changes to the territory, as these traders there are watching their rent and groceries become more expensive than New York, London, or Singapore, whilst more and more of the returns they used to enjoy end up in fewer and fewer pockets. But more importantly, Hong Kong no longer comes with the guarantees of freedom from arrest that you would expect from living in a city like London or New York, with Beijing regularly demonstrating that they're happy to either kidnap you and bring you to the mainland, or even just force laws through that make the extradition process much more official. Even Hong Kong's famed democratic elections are all but gone, and the court system no longer has the international trust it once did. And for the bankers who want to get out, well, they're starting to get out. With Hong Kong experiencing its largest workforce drop of nearly 100,000 workers in 2022 alone. 
But whilst those bankers can get out, there are some where that just isn't an option. Some Hong Kong residents, particularly those born there, are forced to stay for a myriad of reasons. Whether it be because they want their child to go to a Hong Kong school rather than a mainland one, knowing that an education in Hong Kong is likely to benefit their child in the long run, particularly if they're seeking work abroad. Some residents stay because they know they'll be treated poorly on the mainland, with Hong Kongers for decades being portrayed as looking down upon the mainlanders. But others stay because Beijing won't let them leave, fearing these former Hong Kongers may bring some of their luxuries like information, freedom, and demands for free speech with them into the mainland communities. Increasingly, we're seeing more and more people in Hong Kong who can't afford to live, but aren't allowed to leave. The point of Hong Kong was to allow a single shop front that China could allow the West to do all their business through whilst keeping the West out of their mainland business. And for a long time, people were willing to use that system. We all kicked the can down the road, never fully wanting to answer the question, what happens in 2047? But we may not have kicked that can as far as we thought we did. As China's economy's grown, and by the looks of it, so have their ambitions for this region of the world. So what comes next for Hong Kong? Will China attempt to stop the flow of people leaving the region and the concentration of wealth accruing in the territory and return to a one country, two systems? Or will they continue down this road, push through more and more reforms, and finally bring the territory under one country and one system? Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. This has been another incredibly busy week for us here at the show, with us having to shift the order of a few episodes around for reasons that will become more obvious in a few weeks, all of which was made more difficult by the fact of me becoming quite sick this week, as you're probably able to hear. But I feel we were still able to pull together an episode I personally found incredibly fascinating, and I hope you did too. But either way, we hope you enjoyed this piece on Hong Kong and get ready for an even more in-depth piece that we have coming out in just a fortnight's time. And if you want to be kept up to date when that big episode comes out, you can find all of the links and info on our Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Threads, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Redline Pod. Or if you can to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz, Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, and donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep putting together this show and cover all the expenses that come with it. And speaking of our amazing Patreons, this week I'd like to thank Alenzov, Mitch Robinson, Andre M., Ignacio, Alan Lundgren, Ivan Lazarenko, and Tove Kotel, who are the latest patrons to sign up as of time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like these guys, and I'm looking forward to seeing them at our next Patreon meetup in just a week's time. But until then, as usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is The Hong Kong Diaries by Chris Patton, the final British governor of Hong Kong, who oversaw the handover from the UK to China. It's a great first-person account of that pivotal moment in history that also makes some pretty decent predictions about where Hong Kong was going, even back then. The second is Two Systems, Two Countries by Kevin Carrico, for a nationalist guide to Hong Kong and what these protesters are fighting for and what they view they have on the line. The third is Today Hong Kong, Tomorrow the World by Mark Clifford, for a look at how understanding China's moves here may reveal Beijing's next geopolitical steps elsewhere. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, John Fowler, John Coyne, and Dan Harris. I absolutely cannot speak more highly of these three people, all working around my incredibly short deadlines due to my sickness this week and being so flexible on this one. All three of these guys are absolutely amazing. And on top of that, I also want to thank my staff, starting with the primary researchers of this piece, Cameron Gale, Jamie Tanu, Genevieve Dolan-May, Nick McNally, and Andrew Garbery. We managed to pull this episode together for this week so that we could do next week's episode the due diligence it deserves. But it was more than just those guys that made this possible, as I'd also like to thank Cameron Gale, Wade McCarr, the producers, Perry Grace, Daniela Javella, Genevieve Dolan May, Nate Ostiller, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter-Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Ahmad Al Ahmad, Andrew Garbery, Scott Missler Ferguson, Jemima Pentreef, Ben Nutter, Mason Wise, Gabriel Lane, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Raul Devanarayanan, our OSIN analyst, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Kashya Maheshwari, who manages our web projects team, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Munch, our field correspondent. To pull any show together takes a lot of people, but to pull together a show that requires this much research and writing and expertise requires a lot of great people. And these are those people. But with all that in mind, the Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening. And good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, 
our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.